So my name is Beth Marhanka. I'm the acting um, AUL for user services and engagement. And I'm Don Undine. I'm the manager of the Maker Hub. And so today we're going to talk about beyond tools and space, building a community of practice for making. So I believe in the unbounded creativity of humans whose capabilities are augmented by powerful technologies and supportive social structures. These are the words of the distinguished University of Maryland computer science professor Ben Schneiderman in his 2016 book entitled New ABCs of Research Achieving Breakthrough Collaborations. And Schneiderman contends that by combining applied and basic research practices, we will see more rapid progress in both spheres as we seek to obtain powerful new knowledge and solve complex societal problems. So Schneiderman's description of the ABC research life cycle, which is, you'll see in the middle column, bears close similarity to the outline of traditional research, which you see on the left, <laughs> typically undertaken by a single scholar, and to the collaborative process of design thinking, which is um, on the right-hand column. So, um, so traditional research, data collection, research and analysis, and then authoring, publication and dissemination, storage and archive and presentation, um, and then Schneiderman's ABC research life cycle is, you know, you choose an actionable problem and then apply observation and interventional and control and experiments and then you form teams, right, with diverse individuals to solve problems and you test your ideas and prototype and then promote and adopt the, and assess the impact and that's very similar to design thinking process with you know, empathize, define the problem, ideate with other people prototype and then test. So it is, in the words of scholars Michael Shank and Jeffrey Schnapp, the unification between pure and applied scholarship, between thinking and doing. And we've seen this when the potential impact of design labs, like this one at uh, Stanford's D School, and even encounter musings about whether design thinking will become the new liberal arts. And the flourishing of maker spaces across many of our libraries, it's not by accident and not without precedent. Libraries have long been labs for teaching, learning, problem solving, productivity, and have been sprouting new legs through the promotion of digital tools and methodologies. So John Dewey said, give pupils something to do, not something to learn. And the doing is of such nature as to demand thinking learning naturally results. And Piaget said, to understand is to invent. And Papert from the MIT Media Lab, the role of the teacher is to create the conditions for invention rather than provide ready-made knowledge. So the idea that learning takes place through doing and leads to innovation, it's, it's not new. The challenge is that we need to leverage the resources in our maker spaces beyond the initial wonder of new tools, beyond making for making sake, and beyond limit the limitations of funding and expertise, and into the process of designing new producers. The producers who will be ever more capable of drawing the connection between pure and applied scholarship, between thinking and doing, writing and making, between knowledge and the world of things, and between edification and entertainment. Awesome, so if you really like the ideas and quotes expressed in those previous slides, those are all Harriet's, so um, big thanks to her for that. Um, and I find those words really in inspiring to me as I think about ways that this maker hub that we've created, right, um, which can be seen in a lot of different ways uh, to the people by, by the people who use the space. Um, but it's helped me to focus uh, how we talk about the kind of work we do in a way that really addresses both the current mission of the library and the university and the direction that uh, many people see education headed. So um, the way we implement a lot of those ideas is unique to our specific context and mission at Georgetown. The way you might implement a similar type of space or those ideas uh, in your in your spaces and universities might be different. So I'm going to talk a little bit about specifically what we did uh, in the Maker Hub, but um, your mileage may vary. All right, so the Maker Hub itself is a 1,500 square foot space. Um, 
equipped with both high-tech and low-tech tools. We've got the 3D printers and the laser cutters. We have also have sewing machines and CNC routers and uh, a print, print shop and a wood shop and lots of Legos and art crafting tools, which we use extensively to support ideation, design thinking, and prototype exercises. Um, so both high-tech and low-tech things, but we're really going to get beyond these tools really fast. The Idea Lab, uh, which we're very fortunate to have in a space adjacent to the Maker Hub, is more of a space designed to facilitate communication, collaboration, and design. It has lots of whiteboard tables, everything is on wheels, there's mobile walls so the spaces can be easily divided up with whiteboard walls. We have a Lego table surrounded by comfy chairs, which is really great for thoughtful conversation, especially when you like to be, for people who like to be busy with their hands while they're talking about serious issues. Um, again, we're very lucky to have a space where you can ideate and come up with ideas um, in a reflective space and then move right next door to a busy, loud, uh, uh, frenetic space where all the making can happen. So through building these spaces and thinking about how we want to support new models for research and design, we've come up with a handful of engagement types that have really worked for us. And again, what works for you guys might be different. Number one, sort of at the core of what we do and what we found is very scalable for us is supporting drop-in peer-to-peer learning. We're open four to five hours a day, six days a week, and during that time, um, anybody in the Georgetown community can walk into the space and get busy right away learning how to turn their ideas in reality. And much of the physical uh, and service design of the space, which we spend a lot of time thinking about and are constantly iterating on, one of the core goals there is how can we make sure that everybody who walks in the door feels welcome and feels like they can start working right away? How many roadblocks and bottlenecks can we eliminate on their path from turning idea into reality? Um, to maintain our focus on uh, supporting the curriculum of Georgetown and the way that teaching is changing over time, we also focus on deep engagement with faculty. We do one-on-one uh, um, uh, one -on -one meetings with faculty to, to develop custom activities for professors across the university. We do tours. Uh, we've designed entire curriculum integrations where we work with a class throughout the semester, uh, as well as just simple, simply presenting lectures about the nature of maker spaces and maker culture and what that mean, might mean to other departments. So you might not know this, but Georgetown doesn't have an engineering department or an arch architecture school. We don't have a lot of those programs that you might imagine make a lot of use of a maker space. So we found a lot of utility in just being able to show people, say, hey, this is a $2,000 3D printer. That's great for innovation for a certain class of people. This 3D printer over here is $300. What changes when the tools of innovation get so inexp inexpensive? This, this Raspberry Pi computer is $35, and I can use it to program for this $300 3D printer. What changes in terms of policy, global social impact, social justice, when you can put the tools of innovation in people's hands? So we've found a lot of usefulness in just being able to surface these ideas to students who haven't been exposed to it in, in the past in a living lab that's actually putting these practices and ideas into action on a daily basis. We also do lots of workshops, which are a great chance for, uh, for both our students to demonstrate teaching in a different type of capacity. We have basic skill building workshops where our volunteers will teach someone about 3D printing and they get to think about different kinds of methodologies for imparting this knowledge. We also do custom workshops where we invite people from outside the Georgetown community to partner up with other campus departments to run workshops like the feminist wearables workshop we did with the Georgetown Women Coders Club um, and our draw, carve, print uh, workshop that we did with a print master and maker neighbor, I'll talk about that in a second, Lauren Emirates with our special collections department. So we could bring in real prints and also engage uh, our audience with pr printmaking activities at the same time. Uh, also, we do just a lot of one-on-one -on -one consultations and project support. So anybody who walks in the door, they might just have an idea. We're going to sit down with them and work with them one-on-one -on -one to figure out what's feasible for them to do, uh, what's feasible in our space, help them get outside support, bring in uh, external people through our network of contacts to help them work on projects as well. Again, because recognizing that 
education isn't just happening in the classrooms through you know one to many kind of exchanges, but by students taking ideas in their own hands and pushing it forward under their own initiative. Georgetown has a big entrepreneurial program, so we support a lot of entrepreneurial work as well. But I mean, last week I spent uh, a lot of time helping a woman build toys for her cats. So we don't particularly judge the kind of work you do in here because you never know where these things are going to lead. And it's that kind of non-hierarchical approach to learning that we find um, really puts us at the core of the future of learning at Georgetown. Cool, so how do we do this? Um, uh, we don't have scads of money. We don't have a giant grant or a donation yet. If anybody has got, want to write a check, uh, I'll take Venmo as well. Um, but we don't have a lot of staff, right? We have one full-time person, part-time grad students, a handful of work-study staff. Um, but it could be very difficult to make sure we're prepared to support every person that walks in the door with all these different types of skills here. Um, and again, not having um, like a hardcore technical skill type of degree program at Georgetown. We don't have that built-in skill base. So how do we do so much with so little? I'd like to point out on this slide here, you see all those, um, those are aprons hanging up on that window at one of our events. Every volunteer in our space makes their own apron and we, we like to hang them up to sort of show off the diversity of skill sets and approaches to making that are brought into the space on a daily basis. So really core to what we do um, is all about building a community. We want to create a group of people who have a vested interest in the success of the space, who see intrinsic value in meeting with others from all sorts of backgrounds and all sorts of skill sets and coming together to just get really excited about being in this dynamic space. And when we have that as a core, it makes it much easier to reach out for support, to get help with different types of projects because it's an inherently nice, fun, supportive place to be in where you know if you walk in the door, you're likely to get help with whatever problem it is that you're working on. And we see building that culture as in and of itself a design exercise. Um, it, it affects everything from the kind of software we write, the kind of physical spaces that we design, and the types of policies that we introduce to the space to create a supportive, uh, vested community. Core to that community, um, our real superstars, is our volunteers in our volunteer program. So, um, you know, we have limited open hours, but if you're a volunteer in the space, that means you work two hours a week and you get 24-7 uh, access to the space. So you, uh, these volunteers, they start learning how to use all the tools and we have a bit of a scaffolding for them to upskill themselves to become uh, more, uh, more better at, uh, at making. And, become more valuable volunteers, and as they gain, gain in skills, they become more vested in the space, they bring their friends in, and this is sort of our core grassroots people. Um, last semester we had 40, about 40 volunteers, this semester we have about 30, what we notice is a trend that fall seems to be uh, a little bit, students have a bit more free time, and then spring semester it's a little bit less, but we still have enough to keep the space running almost fully on volunteers. So the volunteers are great. There are undergrads, grads, even some staff and faculty are volunteers. But what we notice is that we didn't necessarily have like really uh, hardcore, super skilled folks in all of the areas. Um, you know, a lot of these students might uh, not even have a lot of background with making. So we started the Maker Neighbor program. The Maker Neighbor program is kind of like the volunteer program for professionals and experts who might not be Georgetown affiliated. So they also work two hours a week. They get credentialed with ID cards as, as uh, Georgetown affiliates, and they also get access to the space. And what we found is that these uh, Maker Neighbors, as we call them, become heavily invested in the space, spending a lot more than their allotted two hours working on projects with folks from all over the university. On the left over there is Pascal Girard, who has become super engaged with um, technology initiatives all over campus and bringing them into the space to develop them. And on the right there is Lauren Emirates. She's a print master who has taken over our print shop worked with our laser cutters to w develop laser cut typesets for printing presses and really show some really interesting connections between traditional craft and uh, modern technologies. This has been really exciting for us. Um, all right, so success stories. So what are the, some of the things that we've actually done with this? We've picked three stories here. If you guys are interested, I'll give you a link to our website later. We have the Gillardin and Maker Hub showcase where you can see lots of projects that have come out of the Maker Hub. I just want to share a few that I think 
really well illustrate that connection between some of the new models and traditional models for research as a practice that's supported in the library and the work that we've done in the Maker Hub. Oh, by the way, these are 3D scan brains from the neuroscience department and that students have been coming in. So this is woman is holding us a 3D print of her own brain. All right, so first off is MakerCart. Again, this was produced and actually donated to us by, donated us by Pascal Girard, uh, working with the Center for Social Justice. So the Center for Social Justice was looking for ways to um, help their community uh, learn how to teach STEM uh, education to underserved schools in the Dallas, in the DC area. Uh, so we worked with them to develop a maker cart. The maker cart is this thing on the left there. It's literally a cart on wheels. It has got eight Raspberry Pi computer systems and eight Arduino uh, electronics kits, and that's sufficient to keep 16 kids active doing uh, STEM activities for about two to three hours. And as the maker hub, we don't ourselves go out into these schools and teach these activities. We teach uh, CSJ volunteers how to run these activities with really well-documented workbooks so that they can take this, the cart and the activities and go out to schools and have an impact on the space. It's allowed us to iterate on our design really quickly, get feedback right away, so again, have that really rapid ideation and iteration process that's so important, while simultaneously having an immediate impact on the communities that we're trying to serve. Biomex, you all finished breakfast? Okay, great. So, uh, Mark Connell was a senior in the School of Foreign Service, right? So not a physics, not a biology, not a technology major at all, but he was taking a biology course. During this course, he uh, learned that while there's lots of tests to understand various parts of the body, there's not a good non-invasive test to understand what's going on in the gut biome of the human small intestine. Um, so, working with folks in the Maker Hub, working with our high-resolution 3D printer, um, and folks from the entrepreneurship department that we brought into the Maker Hub to work with him. He developed a pill, it's about yay big and getting, getting smaller with every version that a person can swallow. It's a mechanical device with electronics in it. He built, designed and built all of this himself. And it uh, mechanically activates inside the small intestine and um, samples, samples. Um, and then this pill is retrieved later in some manner. Um, and so doctors can finally tell what's going on in, in like the bacteria biome of your small intestine, which is a little nasty, but also really fantastic and groundbreaking. So he now has patents on this device and is working with researchers in, in West Virginia to bring it to the research market. I love sharing this story, but also it's a little awkward. Um, thirdly is a low-cost air quality monitoring system um, developed by Colin McCormick and then facilitated by our maker neighbor, Pascal Girard. So this class is taught uh, in the Science, Technology, and International Affairs class, which is primarily non-technical students. Um, it's designed to show off the possibilities of low-cost technologies for crowdsourced environmental mo monitoring. You might remember after the Fukushima incident, there was this uh, DIY Geiger counters that were spread, that were developed and spread out all over Japan that totally changed the way that radiation was being tracked after that disaster. This is a similar type of device using similar principles. Each one of these is solar powered. It connects to Wi-Fi um, and reports uh, pollution information and temperature and humidity information to a cloud data surface. And all of this is tracked in real time. It's solar powered and they've been, they all work. Every student built and programmed their own version of this, again, without being CS majors. Um, and they're working all over campus. Pascal Girard engaged with with, with Colin, and they developed a version two that is smaller and even more efficient, and this semester's class just finished building out, uh, you know, 12 versions, uh, uh, copies of version two that are going out soon through our Jesuit network to schools in Hong Kong, Lima, and Nairobi, um, and uh, um, in Kenya. So these, again, we're taking work that we're doing, we're iterating on these things in conjunction with classes that are learning stuff they would not have learned in a traditional manner and finally actually spreading that impact out into the world, which we're really excited about. Thanks, Beth. So um, what have we learned over the last four year journey of creating this, the Maker Hub? We've learned that breaking down barriers is essential to interdisciplinary work and that libraries are particularly well suited to support new models of learning that bring communities of practice together. 
and we believe strongly in opening up opportunities for lifelong learning and exploration with diverse teams that encourage multiple people behind each project. That's really been the success of a lot of the examples that Don brought up, is that somebody comes in with an idea, but the way that they can get it to happen is that they get expertise from other people, that they teach them new skills. A business major comes in and meets somebody from computer science, and that's when the magic really happens, is they learn these skills together and then develop a new product, and even several businesses have started because these partnerships that have come together. Um, there's so many problems that can't be solved individually, and they don't need to be if you have spaces and organizations that bring people together. And at the very heart of what we want to offer is an environment where people problem solve together with a diversity of project types and a diversity of approaches. And we also have learned that play can often be extremely important and can lead to real prototypes and designs. People come into the Maker Hub frequently to use our button makers or to or use a sewing machine, and then they learn 3D printing and they come up with an idea for something else. So for instance, um, people like, this is Sarah Harper, she's one of the staff in the, in the Maker Hub, and she got a grant, a hands-on learning grant, to build an to build an aquaponics station. And so the first step in that was prototyping. So she worked with Don, they were trying to figure out you know, how to build the aquaponics station. Well, they did it in Legos first, and it was the perfect material that then she could move on and create the, the actual aquaponics station. So, um, but, so you need not only the spaces and the tools, but the people, the training, and the support to take play to product. And the Maker Hub, through our volunteer and the Maker Neighbor program, and the larger maker network um, and the communities of practice provides that structure and that support. So moving forward, we want to expand curricular engagement through partnerships with faculty in the STEM fields, in the humanities, from the business school, and the med center, and any other programs that are interested in working with us on campus. And we want to increase support for research and um, of all shapes and kinds. So today, um, we've discussed strategies that have worked well for us at Georgetown, but what's going to work on your campus uh, to build the communities of practice and creativity and, uh, and innovation may be quite different. So during yesterday's plenary, Kathleen Fitzpatrick, she talked about Nobel laureate Eleanor Ostrom's theory of common pool resources. I, I um, encourage you to go and look up Ostrom's theories um, so many of the, p the principles in um, her theories deal with the community participation with the management of resources as they're, as they're adapted to local situations. Um, so anyway, you have to ask those kinds of questions at your campus. Keep faculty engaged, talk to students, talk to other community members, and that's what's going to help build your communities of practice. And so we've got resources on a website. Here's the URL where you can find the slides here and links to the Maker Hub and our contact information. And we have time for, for questions. questions.